Well, let's open our Bibles this morning to Mark chapter 5, verse 21. As we continue the studies through this gospel written by a young man led to the Lord by Peter, who then heard from Peter all that Jesus had done and said. And Mark was years later asked by the Holy Spirit to write this book to highlight Jesus' servanthood. In fact, it is a book about his example to us about staying busy and serving the Lord and, and ever being available. So you read this gospel, you'll find more miracles in it than others, less sermons, more doing, if you will, as Jesus' ever available stances whenever there's an opportunity to tell someone else to reach out day or night, good or bad times, he does so, and so should we. Last week, we had gone with the Lord across the Sea of Galilee to a place called Gadara, where a man lived possessed by the devil in the graveyard, in the tombs. And we watched the Lord <clears throat> marvelously deliver this guy, but we're saddened to see that the reaction of the crowd was they didn't really want anything to do with Jesus. He interrupted their lifestyle. But the Lord didn't just leave them. He sent this man touched by God back to them to be a witness for him. This morning, we'd like to finish chapter 5. There are two stories here that overlap with each other. It has an awful lot to do with knowing God's ability and how he feels about our faith, even as it is just beginning to grow. <clears throat> it appears from verse 21, where we read now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, <clears throat> a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. It appears that he went across the ocean or across the Sea of Galilee six miles in either direction, simply to talk to one guy. Oh, sure, the disciples got to learn a lesson, but, but the trip back and the trip over were all designed to meet one man's needs. And I, I thought about how far God will sometimes go to get to us. You know, maybe it's been a long time since you've been to church, but here you are, and God has taken you down a long road, but he'll go to any length to save, certainly. The stories that we are going to read about this morning are are in Matthew and, and Luke as well, but, but they are a contrast in society kind of portraits and, and the needs that people face no matter where they stand. There is a woman in our story who had suffered 12 years of an incurable disease. It's left her as an outcast of society. She's penniless. She has lost her family. She is barred from the synagogue. She's in constant pain. The hopefulness of getting well is gone. She's at the end of her rope. And then there's a man who really has everything that society could have offered him. Prestige and power, honor from the public, great prestige. And he's been blessed by a daughter that for 12 years has been the joy of his family. The laughter in the home was because of her. And she now finds herself facing death. And so... A 12-year-old dying, a 12-year-old sickness for a woman who is suffering. And you find kind of that both of them, the, the, the wealthy, successful, prestigious man and the woman as an outcast, both find themselves in desperation coming to Jesus in their situations, hoping that he will help. The desperate arrive to find Jesus in their desperation. But isn't that usually where people get saved? It's where... You run out, out of your own kind of ideas, isn't it? We're told in verse 22, <clears throat> as Jesus landed, that behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came. His name was Jairus. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and he begged him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is lying at the point of death. Come and lay your hands upon her that she may be healed and that she may live. And Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. I thought reading 21 how different it is when <laughs> the Lord lands on these different cities. Verse 17 it said that the whole city turned out and said get out of here. Now we read in verse 21 that the whole city gathered together to welcome him. In fact Luke writes they came to welcome Jesus back to Capernaum. So he was well accepted here and well received at least for the moment but that's kind of like every generation right? There are those who will welcome your faith and those who will think you've lost your mind. God works in both crowds. Well, we are introduced to a fellow in verse 22 named Jairus. It says he was one of the rulers of the synagogue. The word archon in Greek means to be the spiritual authority. This guy was no doubt a Pharisee. He was the ruler of the synagogue in Capernaum. 
And if you remember from the Gospels, this particular synagogue in Capernaum had been built by a Roman centurion. He'd fallen in love with the Jews. He had helped finance their place of worship. And Jairus would have known this fellow, but he was the fellow that, remember, the Roman centurion whose servant had gotten sick in Luke chapter 7, and the Jewish leadership from the synagogue had actually gone to Jesus to beg him to take care of it on their behalf. He's a good man. He's helped us build the synagogue. And so Jairus might very well have been one of those folks. We, we do know that Jairus was in, in Mark 3 in the synagogue that morning when that man with a withered hand came in on the Sabbath and Jesus challenged the Pharisees about should he heal him or not? Is it, is it right to do something good on the Sabbath or not? We, we know that he was in the synagogue in chapter 4 when that man possessed by the devil had come into that same synagogue. So Jairus had had some exposure to Jesus. He had seen the work of the Lord. However, because of his position, had he made a public statement to follow him, he would have lost everything that he'd hoped to have. So this was a, a, an interesting dilemma. You know, on the one hand, he was a, maybe a silent follower. On the other hand, he maintained his position of authority in the synagogue itself. Well, this morning, in particular, he had left his house going to look for Jesus, who, who lived in town. Had been told by the people that he was gone, but he was expected to come back. The crowds were, were lining the seashore there at Capernaum, if you will, and, and, and the crowd was waiting. And, and can you imagine Jairus waiting, panicking, pacing back and forth, wondering. He had little time. His daughter seemed to not be getting better. It, it could be any moment now. He had to get to Jesus and he had to convince him to come along with him. This man who had such great authority and had such a prominent place in life seems now to understand what value of life really meant. In fact, everything now seemed to take a different tone and a different look. This was his only child, Luke tells us. And all of a sudden, everything that mattered to him before mattered very little now. The neighbor with the loud music matters very little. The congested freeway doesn't really matter. Now what matters is that she get well. This is his pride and joy. So Jairus would have had an easy way through the crowd. Being a Pharisee and, a, you know, and, and being a rabbi, they would have parted literally for him. And I, I suspect he didn't have much trouble getting to Jesus, but the hard part came next. Because as a, a, a member of the, you know, the, the leadership, the rabbi leadership, Jairus was, was about to do something that was going to destroy his, his social life. Right? He was going to swallow his pride and he was going to turn his back on all the social pressure and he was going to say goodbye to the religious establishment, to his privileged position because he had a daughter that needed help. And so he falls flat on his face in front of Jesus in a large crowd and with panic in his voice and tears in his eyes, he says to the Lord, you got to come. My little daughter is lying near death. If you could just come and lay your hands on her, upon her, she, she could be healed. She could live. His words are powerful. They're desperate, <laughs> but they are filled with a faith that, that you don't necessarily expect from this man. You come. You lay your hands upon her. She'll be healed. She'll live. And it says he begged him earnestly. It's in the imperfect tense in, in, in verb in Greek, which means... He didn't just say it once. He kind of just kept saying it over and over, almost as if, you know, if he could say it a bunch of times, Jesus couldn't say no. It was a man that was driven by tremendous despair. And, and, and the head rabbi in town is now on his face before the radical rabbi who's come to save the world. Interesting picture. Now, I'm not suggesting that, that, that Jairus' faith here is mature or that it's pure. You don't find him repenting of his sins. You don't find him confessing that he was wrong. You don't hear him laying down his life to follow Jesus. But in his situation, his heart is being turned to where he is giving of himself to seek God. And to the Lord, that beginning step of faith was sufficient. I mean, he was making a turn, if you will. Things weren't all like they should be in every area of his life, but he was beginning to trust. And, and in a few minutes, his faith will be you know, preciously tried but, but for now, the Lord was, was happy to see him coming in his despair. You should know that. <laughs> you may not have a perfect understanding of who God is, but if you'll come, he'll begin with you wherever you start with him. It seems to me that just watching people over the years get saved, that most people get saved at the worst of times. It's hard to see people get saved when everything's going well. But when things are under the gun like now, 
It, it does seem like that has a way of bringing us to the end of ourselves. I think it was C.S. Lewis who wrote years ago, God whispers to us in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. And then he said, pain or suffering is God's megaphone to the world. Because pain is kind of indiscriminate, isn't it? It, it falls on you and I alike, and God doesn't create evil, but he created the potential for evil when he gave man a choice. But love isn't really love meaningfully if you don't have a choice. So something happened here to Jairus' heart. He was humbled, he was purified, he, he became dependent, and God was using it for good. It wasn't an enjoyable time. But here's the man broken. And, and I love verse 24. In all of the three Gospels, they don't mention Jesus saying a word to him. All it says in all three of the Gospels is Jesus went with him. <laughs> he just, all right, let's go. Not a word was spoken. But notice that verse 24 said, so did a great multitude following and thronging him. Because that kind of sets the stage for what comes next. I'm sure if you were Jairus, you're in a hurry. Get out of the way. Let Jesus through. Healing on the way. But a crowd like this doesn't move very fast. Right? In fact, the word throng here is the Greek word for choke or strangle. This, this crowd doesn't hurry. There's way too many people. This is an ambulance caught in traffic. There's no way in the world that you're going to get people moving. And I can just watch Jairus' you know, frantic looks just wanting to push people out of the way. Come on. You realize what's at stake here. And the crowd becomes the backdrop for what happens next and for the testing of Jairus' newly found faith. Because out of seemingly nowhere, Jesus doesn't speed up. He slows down. In fact, Jesus stops and begins to talk to the crowd and I would think for Jairus, every second was eternity. They're, don't stop now. Let's walk and talk. Let's not stop and talk. Verse 25 says, There was a certain woman who had a flow of blood 12 years and had suffered many things from many different doctors. She had spent all that she had. She was no better. She was getting worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment, for she said, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she had been healed of the affliction. To Jairus' great desire to move quickly, this interruption comes from a woman he's not aware of or, or, or even aware of what's going on around him. But into this large crowd comes a woman hemorrhaging for the last dozen years, an illness that was chronic and it was persistent it had debilitated her. It was painful. Ostracized her from society. According to the Levitical law, she was to be unclean. She was bleeding. She couldn't be in touch with people. She couldn't come to church or to the temple, to the synagogue, isolated from, from people holding her and hugging her and loving her. And, and if that wasn't bad enough, the cultural bias of the day was that if you had this kind of suffering, it was because you were living an immoral lifestyle. So not only did she have the physical pain, that this would have brought. She had to suffer from wrongful accusations and from the assumptions of others for a dozen years. In fact, when Jairus' daughter was born, this woman got sick. And they had been running together for 12 years now in the same regard. She had spent every dime she had trying to find a cure. She's gone to a lot of doctors who promised help, and things hadn't gotten better. They'd only gotten worse. In fact, Dr. Luke writes in his account, there was no cure. And she was at the end of herself. In her desperation, she had heard about Jesus. Nothing else had worked. She had nowhere else to turn. And so she came this day, pushing through the crowds, defying the law of Moses, coming in contact with others, all wrong religiously. In fact, her actions were made all the more dangerous by the fact that when she looked up to see Jesus, standing next to her was that guy the head of the synagogue, Jairus, the, the guy who could make it hell for her. He, he could really lay down the law. She'd have to make sure he didn't see her. Verse 28 tells us, though, what drove her. She thought to herself, if I could just touch his garment. The word haptomai means to clutch or to, to grab. I know if I could just grab hold of him, I'll, I'll be made well. Perhaps she'd seen the Lord lay her, his hand on lots of people and were healed and figured, well, it must work in reverse. Maybe if I can just lay my hand on him, 
There was nothing magical about the garment. But here, too, she came with a limited amount of faith and conviction that the Lord would somehow use this to touch her life in her despair. Let me touch the border of his garment, these tassels that that we read about in Numbers 15 that the men were to wear uh, on their clothing at the end with blue thread through them to remind them of all that God had said and that God had done. And Jesus wore them on his robe. And the the woman thought, I'll just sneak up behind him, grab a tassel, get healed, and get out of Dodge. No one will know. Especially that guy Jairus, who looks mad. He looks so upset. Well, he was. (laughs) He could make my life miserable. Well, her hopes, verse 29, were realized. She touched Jesus' clothes, his garment, the tassel, and she could feel in her body the healing take place, the drying up of, of the relief of all of the hemorrhaging that she'd suffered. The pain was gone. And I think if she wasn't so afraid, she'd have yelled, Yahoo! as loud as she could. But not here, not now. And she'd have gotten away with it if the Lord hadn't stopped and recognized that power had gone forth from his life into hers. Verse 30 says, and Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, hey, who touched my clothes? (laughs) His disciples said to him, look at the multitude choking you. And you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. Imagine Jesus stopping and Josh going, for crying out loud. Come on. Just a minute, Jairus. All right, who touched me? And Peter went, you got to be kidding me. Like a hundred people. That guy touched you, that guy touched you, that lady over there bumped into you. The disciples had not distinguished between the press of the crowd and the clutch of faith. Couldn't really see the difference between an act of trust and a pushing forward just out of curiosity. But, but he was aware that power had gone out from him and he responded immediately because... He didn't want this person to get away without speaking to them. In fact, he had more in mind to do for her than she was hopeful to ask of him herself. He didn't ask because he didn't know. He asked because he did. And it appears that from verse 32 that looking around, he finally made eye contact with her. And there was no way she could have a poker face at this point. Tears in her eyes, fear and joy all at the same time. Maybe she'd gotten to the edge of the crowd, was almost gone when she heard those words, who touched me? Uh Uh-oh. And made the mistake of looking back, and the Lord was looking right at her. You're the one, aren't you? And now she's stuck. Jesus knew that power had gone forth. You know, it's interesting. Ministry costs you something. It takes a toll upon you. It did upon the Lord, which is why I think through Mark, and especially Luke, who writes about the humanity of Jesus, You constantly find Jesus tired, exhausted, falling dead asleep in a storm. It it took some effort, didn't it? And it was for us. Well, Luke says that initially when the Lord asked the question that everyone in the crowd said, one me, one me, they all had said denied him. But now the Lord had caught her eye. Somebody touched me. I perceive power has gone out from me, he says, and his eyes finally met hers. And we are told in verse 33, that the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. What a place to have to speak up. You thought you had a good plan. (laughs) I just want something from the Lord. I want to tell anybody. Yeah, you can't get away with that. She has to now speak up before the crowd, in a large crowd, with an angry Jairus, looking at his watch especially in this illness that would have disqualified her from the culture with a questionable illness, a a culture that doesn't allow women to speak publicly much. Looking, and I think if Jairus' looks could kill, she'd have been dead. I'm sure he was just throwing icicles her way. You stopped us for this? One thing for sure, testifying for Jesus can be frightening, Even, even humbling and combative, But but how can you not say it? Notice what it says there in verse 33. She came trembling, but she knew what he'd done. There was really no way off the hook. This is what God has done in my life. That's what motivates us. Knowing what he's done, we have to tell others. 
And so she coughed it all up, every word of it. I, I've been sick for 12 years. I'm out of money. I can't be healed. I snuck through the crowds. I was sure I could get in and get out. And I, almost got, I almost got away with it. And you caught me. What would the Lord say to her? Verse 34, daughter, your faith has made you well. Now you go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Oh, this had to be like the best thing she'd ever heard in her life. I'm sure she expected to be castigated and yelled at, maybe told off, and what are you doing running through the crowd like that? No, no, no. He calls her his daughter. <laughs> great, great, great picture to me. Daughter. She now belonged to him. Her hand had touched his robe, but her believing heart had caused him to touch her life. So go in peace. First fruit of salvation is always that. You find peace with God. And be healed. Your faith has made you well. Is this, is this strong faith? Is this developed faith? No. This is just the, the embryo of faith, much like Jairus. But notice God is interested in just a move towards him. Whatever the reason, whatever the motivation, whatever the understanding, he's quick to save. And Jesus had to speak to her so that he might encourage her and, and that he might use her as a testimony to others and even an encouragement to Jairus, although he didn't feel like that at the moment. But I want you to notice that the cycle of God's work is always the same. We read it in Psalm 50 this morning, verse 15. It says, you'll call upon me in the day of trouble. I'll answer you and deliver you and you'll glorify me. Those three steps. I'm in trouble. I ask God for help. God helps me. He wants me to glorify him. He did it. He changed me. He saved me. I'm obligated to tell someone else because of the work he's done in my life. Well, into this beautiful, touching scene comes this devastating news from Jairus' family, verse 35. While Jesus was still speaking, while he was saying, you go in peace, <laughs> came the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, uh, some, some came from the family, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Oh my, the smiling woman, the grieving man, stupid woman, stupid crowd. If we'd have just gone when I'd said go, we might have made it. But no, we got to talk to her. And while Jesus was still speaking, he's interrupted. But notice verse 36. As soon as Jesus hears the words that were being spoken to him, he said to Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, look, don't be afraid. Only believe. Well, that's a great promise. But, oh man, what a challenge. Don't fear now. You are here trusting me. Keep at it. It's in the present tense. Literally, you came here trusting me. Don't give up on me now. In fact, we read over in Luke that the Lord says, she's going to be made well. She's going to be all right. No, no, Lord, she's dead. Okay, don't, don't give up now. Really? Talk about a severe test of faith. I don't know how he makes it through, but I'll tell you what, whenever you open the Bible and you start to look for the kind of faith God is pleased with, great faith, it is always defined as those who will hang on to him when all seems lost. Whether it's Noah in the ark or Abraham wandering around in the wilderness waiting for a son years later, offering Isaac 25 years later, or Moses refusing to be a son of Egypt, leading them out into the middle of nowhere. Wherever you find tremendous challenges, God calls the faith great. Jehoshaphat was a fellow that was a king when the Moabites came against him with a million-man army, Second Chronicles 20. And he said to the people, well, we've got to fight for our land. We're God's people. And then he said to the Lord, Lord, a great multitude is coming out against us from beyond the sea won't you judge them? We have no power against this big of a multitude. We don't know what we're going to do. And the last sentence out of his mouth were, but we're going to trust you. And God honored the faith. It was overwhelming faith. It was faith beyond reason. And God honored it. And now <laughs> Jairus hears this. It'll all be all right. Maybe he didn't hear him. She said, he said that she died. I know. Hang in there. All will be well. So you have a 12-year-old sick woman who's now well and a 12-year-old daughter who's now dead. 
Well, at this point, verse 37 tells us that Jesus stopped the crowd from going any further. How he did it, I have no idea. But he permitted no one to follow him except for these three, Peter, James, and John, James's brother, the inner circle, the executive committee. We find them a lot with Jesus, the inner circle of trainees. Mount of Transfiguration, these three guys show up. In the Garden of Gethsemane, these three guys are there. And he heads into the home with a distraught ma, a father and three disciples in training in tow and the crowd that's been put away. Verse 38, they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue. There was a tumult there, and there were those who wept and wailed loudly. And he came in, and he said to them, why are you making this commotion and weeping? So the child's not dead, he's sleeping. And they ridiculed him, but when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him, those three men, and he entered into where the child was lying. At the, at the house, the professional mourners had already arrived. Jewish practice, even in those days, was to hire professional wailers, not to pretend that you were brokenhearted, but to be sure everyone knew that you were. You know, Jewish law then and today requires burial within 24 hours of death. You don't have much time to outwardly mourn, but, but these professional mourners came to kind of to, to loudly let the neighbors and everyone else know that your heart was being broken. And they were already at the house when Jesus arrived. And it was the Lord who said to them, look, she's not dead, she's sleeping. You guys can go home. And they laughed at Jesus. Yeah, we know dead, this is what we do. When they're dead, we show up. If they're not dead, we go home. That's the way it works. She's dead, very dead, we're gonna mourn. And they mocked Jesus. It's interesting how Jewish funerals are. Our funerals are extremely quiet. Jewish funerals are not. There's a lot of wailing going on. You wear your finest clothes to a Jewish funeral. They tear theirs in mourning. But not this one. This was no funeral day. The Lord wanted everyone to be sure. So he says, no, no, she's not dead. She's sleeping. Which, by the way, is a word that the Lord uses in the Bible to speak of believers who have died. They're asleep. They haven't, they're not dead in the sense of being lost. They're, they're at rest. And that word is never used for unbelievers in the scriptures who have died unless it's used in a spiritual sense to say, well, they were spiritually asleep. But a child of God who dies physically says, the Lord says, he's sleeping. Remember when the Lord took the boys over to see Lazarus and he says, where are you going? We're going to Jerusalem. What's dangerous there? Yeah, well, Lazarus, my friend's asleep and I want to go wake him up. And they said, well, if he's asleep, he'll wake up on his own. The Lord says, he's dead. Good thing I wasn't there. He wouldn't have been dead. I'm going to go wake him up. First Thessalonians, Paul talks about not everyone shall sleep, but we shall all be changed. And, and even Stephen, you know, when Stephen preached in Acts, what chapter would that be? Chapter 7, I guess. When he got done preaching, it says that he turned to the crowd and, and then up to heaven and said, Lord, don't lay this sin to their charge. And then it says when he had said this, he fell asleep. So God's different terminology for those who are dead versus those who are dead in Christ. Um, Real death, by the way, is spiritual, isn't it? You can be physically alive and be very dead. I think Paul, when he wrote to Timothy about the widows in the church that weren't walking with God, said, you know, she lives in pleasure. She's dead while she lives. He said of the prodigal son, he was dead, but now he's alive. So Jesus puts everybody out of the house, leaves his inner circle of three, mom and dad there, and he turns to talk to this little girl, verse 41, and he takes this child by the hand, and he says to her, Talitha, Kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Common language of the day, Aramaic. In fact, when the children of Israel went into Babylonian captivity, they lost their Hebrew. So only the scholars spoke Hebrew. The people spoke Aramaic. This is, these are Aramaic words. And, and literally translated, it, it is little lamb, get up. Could have been the very things mom and dad said to her every morning to get her up for school. Called her their little lamb. But Jesus, with great endearing words, speaking kindly to her. And immediately, verse 42, the little girl arises and she walks. She was 12 years old. And they, the five, overcome with great amazement. And I would think that's even an understatement, isn't it? Luke 8, 55 says, her spirit returned to her immediately. And if you really want to know what physical death is, it's the leaving of your spirit from your body. Jesus demanded it come back and it did. Now, I don't know what the reaction of the, of the people were. I don't know how the parents survived it. The word 
Amazement in Greek is literally the word for blow your mind. It really is a 60s word. Blows my mind, man. Because it literally means I can't compute this. I don't understand this. I don't know how to process this. They were overwhelmed. And then he commanded them strictly, verse 43, don't tell anyone. That's going to work, isn't it? And then said that they should give her something to eat. And I always thought, thought that was so interesting. He raised her from the dead, but not with a full stomach. <laughs> isn't that funny? Because God will do what you can't do, but he expects you to do what you can. So from the miraculous to the mundane, she's weak. She hasn't been eating. Feed her and don't tell anyone. Well, Matthew says the report of it went out into all the land. But why did Jesus say this? Because he wanted to minimize the followers who didn't want to hear him. They just want something from him. It never did work. So he gets his daughter back. The desperate in Jesus. Now, up until this point, the social stigma had kept Jairus from coming. But his daughter was more valuable than what he owned in the world, and he was willing to give it all up to go to Jesus. The woman, in her desperation, had done everything right in all the ways that she could until she ran out of opportunity and found only the Lord was the one that she could go to. And so she finally breaks every rule in the book, you know, religiously, to get to him. Even tries sneaking off, doesn't work. But here's the great picture, you know. At some point, hopefully, your need for Jesus will outweigh the cost of following him for you. Or, or, or it will, in your desperation, help you to find him. I, I just want him no matter what. I don't care what I lose in the process. I don't care what I have to go through. I need him in, in my life. And then he'll save you. And he'll say to you what he said to this woman. Look, your faith has made you well. Don't be afraid, he said to Josh. You just believe me. Things will be just fine. Still true. I don't know what's kept you from the Lord, but whatever it is, it isn't worth keeping you from him. He has eternal life to give. Maybe this morning that's where you'll end up. Father, thank you this morning as we sit together that in our desperation, Lord, you are very available. And in, in the worst of times when we have on the line what seems to be the most important thing in our life, you're still there, faithful to your word. And so, Lord, I would pray for us this morning that if there are folks in our midst who are here, it's been a struggle to get here. It, they're still trying to live in the world as if all is well, and yet they know who you are, like Jairus, who saw and experienced, but wasn't willing to take it on for himself until his need became so great that for some, Lord, this morning, that'll be what drives them to you. Or, or someone like this woman, Lord, not, not a big name in society. No one probably knew much of her, but she had suffered, lost all, had nothing left. And yet in that low place, she looked up and, and heard from you, daughter, your, your faith has made you well. Lord, that we might see that it, it is your wish that we would have life, but we're going to have to come to you. And we can wait till it gets so desperate we got nowhere else to turn. Or we could just decide today. There are a lot of things that can offer us many things in the world, but none of them can offer us life like you. And maybe this morning, that's where you're at. And the Lord has brought you to church to give you life. Maybe you've been here for a long time, but you have yet to say yes to Jesus, to accept him into your life. Well, there's some guys up front after the service that would love to pray with you. And, and if your desperation for him is greater than your fear about what others might think, today might be your day to be truly freed from sin and death. Jesus is the only name given whereby you can be saved. God in the flesh, who died for our sins so that we could live in him. And if you'll call upon his name, if you'll look to him, if you'll believe in him, he will do everything he's promised to do in giving you life. So come this morning. And for those of you that know Jesus, go tell someone. The woman we read, knowing what was done in her, <laughs> had to come back and tell him everything. Well, look what God has done for you. All he wants you to do is tell someone. So go tell someone. Tell them the whole truth. Tell them the whole story. Shall we stand?